I've got a load horse anyway. Okay, uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Professor Hamish McCallum, the Acting Dean of Research for Griffith Sciences. First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'd also like to acknowledge the guests we've got here this evening. We have representatives from a large number of organisations, including GROCON, SEQ Water, Brisbane City Council, Logan City Council, Gold Coast City Council, a range of Queensland government departments, including the Department of Transport and Main Roads, Department of Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning, and Environment and Heritage Protection, Queensland Reconstruction Authority, TransLink, Hornibrook Consulting, and a range of researchers from Griffith, UQ, and QUT. And welcome everybody to this impact event, Regional Planning for Successful Cities. We started this impact lecture series about two years ago with the goal of engaging the public with the diversity of what we do, science, engineering, technology endeavours at Griffith University. Over the past two years, we've covered a very wide variety of topics. They go all the way from 3D printing, how automation is going to change our working lives, climate change, sports engineering and so forth. We've engaged thousands of individuals who've come together to discuss some of the challenges facing our society and how science, engineering and innovation can step up and meet those challenges. One of the challenges that affects us all, living in Queensland's southeast corner, is how we keep our cities not only functioning efficiently and sustainably, but also how we encourage the citizens of our cities to live healthy, active and productive lives. Last week, we launched our new Cities Research Centre, renewing our focus on cities. The Cities Research Centre follows 12 years of excellent research from the Urban Research Programme. This has now been sufficient, uh, significantly expanded and reimagined to include not only urban planners, economists and health professionals and architects, but a new group of engineering researchers. So it's a much broader and substantially redeveloped concept. This new interdisciplinary team is focused on making our cities better places to live and work through research and engagement with government and industry and the general public. And we'll work through three major research themes. The first one is intelligent infrastructure. How we use intelligent or smart infrastructure and planning to manage natural resources, build resilience, coordinate infrastructure systems and plan cities growth. Um, the second theme is quality places, which focuses on urban design dimensions of cities and the challenges those present for improving the quality of urban places and neighbourhoods. It'll focus on key challenges for governments, industry and the community sector, including the promotion of urban happiness and satisfaction in cities. The third theme is transforming communities. Cities, of course, are not static, and this stream looks at the transformation of cities, especially the social, political and economic systems that affect how we live. The new centre is also concerned with how we pay for urban infrastructure and services as previous policy instruments become redundant. An important focus of our research in this stream will be on urban transformations provoked by major events such as the 2018 Commonwealth Games, something which I expect to be a feature of tonight's discussion. So with all that in mind, let's get into our discussion. Regional planning for successful cities how can we can build more resilient infrastructure, sustainable communities and great places in South East Queensland. The format of this evening is meant to be inclusive of all of you. Each of our speakers will have a short period, about 10 minutes, to introduce themselves and offer some details about their background and what they see as the challenges facing cities in general and those in South East Queensland in particular. We're then going to um, open up our floor to you, our audience, for questions and answers. This discussion will be guided by Dr. Tony Matthews, who's in the front row here. He's one of our up and coming urban planners. He's very generously agreed to step in at the last minute. Um, Professor Brendan Mackey, who is was the director of the Griffith Climate Response Program, was meant to be in this role, but he's just had some very significant dentistry and we thought we didn't want to inflict him drooling on all over the, uh, the lectern and uh, being 
probably less than his usual uh, highly articulate self. Um, so I'm very grateful for, for Tony stepping in at this very late notice. Um, he's a keen advocate for how cities need to adapt. Um, so before I hand over to, uh, to Tony, um, if you're tweeting this evening, and I encourage you to tweet, although I don't tweet much myself, um, there's a hashtag which is hashtag GUImpact. So I'll now hand over to uh, Dr Matthews, who will introduce each speaker and guide us through the remainder of the evening. Thanks, Tony. Uh, thank you, Hamish, uh, for that uh, introduction. And uh, lovely to see everybody here this evening. Um, just as an aside, uh, I'm, I'm a latecomer to Twitter, but uh, it's really good fun um, and a real distraction. Uh, so do tweet. And also the hashtag Griffith Advantage is our specific planning one. Uh, it falls to me to introduce our three speakers. Uh, as Hamish explained, the, the running order will be uh, my introduction of the speakers. The speakers will then have about 10 to 15 minutes each uh, to give an overview uh, and have some discussion about subject. Uh, and then we'll turn over to a Q&A, which will uh, be uh, uh, back to you guys. So uh, I might lead one or two questions, but then we'll turn it to the floor. And uh, uh, please uh, um, feel free to ask any questions you deem relevant. And any questions regarding urban governance, we'll specifically direct to Paul, because uh, I know he enjoys that subject. Um, OK, so if I may introduce our speakers, first of all, we have Mr. Greg Van. Uh, Greg is the chairman of uh, Buckley Van Planning and Development, a consultancy uh, that has been long established and is much respected in Brisbane, uh, and is currently also program director with the Queensland government working on the Southeast Queensland Regional Plan revision. So the new plan should be com coming out soon, and uh, Greg is uh, central to making sure that that uh, process runs well. He's qualified in planning and economics and has, has been at the forefront of planning in Queensland for almost 40 years now. Uh, not that he looks much younger than that. I was actually surprised when I, when I read this, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> he has a, a wide diversity of experience as a consultant, uh, having worked previously in local and state government. Uh, he seeks to make the world a better place through strategic leadership, mentoring, inspiration, uh, advocacy roles, and being an honest broker. And, and uh, uh, Greg is a lovely guy, and I'm delighted that he's here. Um, joining Greg tonight is Di Curry, who is the Director of Planning and Environment at the City of Gold Coast Council. Uh, Di is the Director uh, uh, of Planning and Environment uh, uh, down there on the Gold Coast and also president of the Commonwealth Association of Planners representing approximately 40,000 uh, planners who are working uh, throughout the Commonwealth. She has extensive experience in leadership and management, uh, in strategic planning, business processes uh, and development assessment. She has a strong track record of delivering major projects across a diverse range of planning programs and enjoys a strong professional network across all levels of government, the development industry and the planning profession. Uh, Dai is an adjunct professor at the University of Southern Queensland and a member of the UN Habitat's policy, units ex policy unit uh, of experts uh, preparing for Habitat 3. Uh, Dai is uh, the immediate past president and a fellow of the Planning Institute of Australia and a lifetime honorary member of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Uh, she's also a fellow of the Urban Development Institute of Australia and is known for her commitment to working with uh, the development industry and for her proactive attitude and results-driven approach. So thank you die for taking the time to join us tonight. Uh, and completing our panel is Professor Paul Burton, who is the uh, current director of the City's Research Centre uh, at Griffith University. Uh, Paul is also Professor of Urban Management and Planning at Griffith, and uh, he is our founding director for the New Cities Research Centre. So we're very thankful to him for his efforts in that regard. We're delighted that uh, we have come so far. Previously, Paul was director of the Urban Research Programme. Uh, and also acting director of the Griffith Climate Change Response Programme. He's a member of Regional Development Australia, an active member of the Planning Institute of Australia, and also active with the Urban Development Institute of Australia. Paul's current research in, uh, uh, interests focus on the theory and practice of public participation and community engagement, the everyday professional lives of planners, metropolitan and strategic planning, and adaptive planning for climate change. Uh, so thank you, Paul, also for being here tonight. Now with that, I'll ask our panelists to assume their places at the top table, and uh, we'll hear, I believe, first of all from Paul. Right. Thank you very much indeed for those kind words, Tony, and uh, Hamish for your introductions. Um, I thought I'd um, 
start partly because our, our brief invited us, uh, as did Tony, to uh, give a bit of kind of personal background. Um, so I thought I'd give you a, a, just a, um, a kind of couple of uh, biographical details. First of all, um, uh, if, you, if, if you are a tweeter and you follow me, uh, you'll know that I'm a POM. Uh, that is included in my uh, uh, Twitter uh, handle. But actually, I'm Welsh. And if any of you have recently been following the uh, European football championships, you'll know that the distinction between England and Wales uh, is a significant and an increasingly important one to draw, not least in uh, regional planning uh, terms as well. Uh, their voting patterns in the recent Brexit vote were uh, not what I would have hoped for as a Welshman, but I'm in no, no position to chastise them because I didn't get my act together to uh, use my vote uh, whilst I was over there. Um, so, as if you like a, a pommy planner, I'm used to regions being used to refer to those big areas that in the UK we divide the country up into, like the southwest, where I used to live. Um, or the Northwest, or even, in my view, somewhat politically incorrectly, uh, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, which are treated as regions for, for planning purposes. And I, although I've lived here now for nine years, I'm still not used to regions and regional being used to refer principally to rural or remote areas, so I often uh, still get confused about that. Um, uh, the second thing uh, is that I've been looking at UK regional policy for some time now, <coughs> excuse me, although not recently in any great detail, um, and I remain uh, intrigued at the uh, relationship between, if you like, the political and moral argument for, for regional policy we must do something about these disparities, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, and the empirical evidence of their effectiveness. Uh, and I have to say that the, the evidence of the effectiveness of decades of regional policy in the UK, and probably in uh, the rest of uh, the European Union, is not great. So those kind of biographical things to one side, what I was going to do was, was pose myself and then try and answer for uh, brief and, and fairly simple questions. So the first is why we have regional policy uh, in the first place. Um, and I guess the simple, if not simplistic and obvious reason is that regions, however we de define and understand them, uh, grow at different rates and that there are typically inequalities uh, between regions that are seen certainly by economists, as inefficient and inequitable. Um, so regional differences and disparities and inequalities and possibly inequities are something that exist and, and are something that governments for some time now have felt obliged to do something about. Um, now, some people argue that uh, economic development at any spatial scale, whether it's at the global scale, the national scale, regional or even local, is inevitably and unavoidably uneven, um, and that there's not a lot that can be done about that through policy intervention, at least nothing that uh, doesn't indeed exacerbate the problem or come at significant cost to other areas. So there's a, there's a significant body of work amongst economists that, that take that kind of somewhat skeptical view. So depending on where you sit on in that uh, particular debate, regional policy is either something that's unfair and restricts developments in areas that, if you like, the market favours, um, or you subscribe to the view that it's sensible to invest in uh, uh, lagging regions, if you like, because they have unused capacity that could be used to greater effect. Um, there are also some interesting um, if, academic debates about the relative merits of investing in physical infrastructure, roads, railways, ports, airports, etc., or in human capital. Um, so that what we do, we might we can either invest in the the infrastructure in those lagging regions, or we could invest in the human capital and the capacity of the people who live in those areas uh, to work more efficiently and to attract investment on the basis of their increased capacity to work productively. Um, now there is of course a tendency to kind of polarise things in that way and in, in, in perhaps in an unhelpful way and, and it's, I I'm, would be somewhat encouraged by uh, more recent approaches that try and integrate the two and to say that 
policy should aim to integrate lagging and leading regions, if that's how you want to describe them, uh, rather more effectively, rather than seeing them as separate and disconnected entities, and that that might involve investing in uh, better physical and digital connections between places, connective infrastructure, if you will. So that leads me to my second question, which is, well, in that case, if you've made an argument, um, and I may not have done, uh, for regional policy in the first place, then what issues are best addressed at a regional scale, adopting my UK understanding of region as uh, a kind of metropolitan sub-state, sub-national uh, entity rather than regional as, as rural or remote. Um, <coughs> So in terms of the things that we might focus at at that particular scale, well, I guess connective infrastructure that I just mentioned seems to me something that uh, should certainly be planned uh, and delivered at a regional, if not a state scale, or maybe even a national scale. We have interesting debates have been going on for the last year or so about whether we should have a, a national urban policy, and if so, what that should uh, look like and uh, consist of. But if you're going to have a national broadband ne network, uh, a national high-speed rail line, a national freight network, then there's clearly an argument for national-level planning that might also manifest itself as a series of kind of joined-up uh, regional plans. Um, it might also mean taking a view on where you focus and try and channel growth, whether you call them growth poles or growth centres across a region, so that everyone's not competing to be the centre of their regional universe. I well remember in the UK, probably back in the early 90s, everyone, not everyone, a lot of uh, local authorities wanted to be known as the heart of England, you know, and according to, if you, if you looked at all the places that claimed that in their strap line, there were about seven hearts of England, all within probably an hour's drive of each other, which seemed uh, somewhat uh, disingenuous and uh, wasteful. Um, but deciding that at a regional scale, we're going to focus growth in one area rather than another is perhaps sensible and compelling to economic, uh, those of an economic or even an economic rationalist outlook. But of course, it presents political challenges and ambitious uh, political leaders such as mayors may not be too keen to give up uh, their chance to advocate for their uh, centre being the centre of that regional universe. Um, the, the final thing I'd say on that is um, that uh, uh, what's best dealt with at different spatial scales evolves. I don't think it's something that's set and has been set over time. Um, and certainly as new technologies evolve, then that presents us with new challenges and opportunities. And certainly I think in the infrastructure field, we're seeing moves perhaps towards a more decentralized uh, system in order to build uh, and strengthen the resilience of infrastructure systems so that you're not at perhaps a Southeast Queensland type scale entirely dependent on one uh, grid or network which if it if it's faced with a, a you know major catastrophic threat could go down uh, the third question is how we best bring a political dimension to these debates and developments um, and it seems obvious to me that if you're looking at a regional scale like Southeast Queensland, which entails some collection or aggregation of smaller political entities, city, shire, and regional councils, then there's an unavoidable political challenge of coordination, uh, political coordination, as well as technical and policy coordination. And it's, in my view, quite interesting that um, our last Minister for Cities, our current Assistant Minister for Cities and Digital Transformation, have both been sold quite effectively the idea of um, copying some elements of the UK city deals model. The first uh, city deals model that came out of the traps was Greater Manchester that involved um, uh, dangling some fiscal carrots in front of a group of municipal authorities and getting them to work together. Interestingly, recreating what had been the Greater Manchester Metropolitan County Council area until Mrs Thatcher decided to abolish it in the early 80s because they voted the wrong way. Um, but anyway, they've reconstituted that. But most interestingly, and again, in the face of a big fiscal carrot, they have decided amongst themselves to allow uh, one person to be the directly elected mayor of that entire entity. And that's something that the South East Queensland Council of Mayors might or might not like to contemplate. Um, my fourth and final question is, are regional plans such as the South East Queensland Regional Plan that uh, Greg is currently working on the best vehicles for achieving a greater degree of policy integration uh, or not? 
and I think one of the biggest challenges facing governments and indeed many large organisations is how to overcome barriers uh, that come into existence uh, in the form of organisational or that come with the existence of organisational silos and in universities certainly uh, we organise ourselves into faculties and schools and departments and so on and then we spend a lot of time inventing uh, things like my new research centre which are designed to cut across those boundaries because we don't want people to remain stuck in their departments, their faculties uh, or their schools. So um, that's a, it's a, that, that the almost inevitability of, of a degree of silo organisation uh, but how we overcome some of the consequence of that. And, and the same would be the case within uh, city government. So Di is the Director of Planning and Environment but she needs to work with her colleagues in economic development and major projects in city infrastructure and community services and so on. And while she's very good uh, at doing that, um, big uh, different bits of council bureaucracies, not necessarily the city of Gold Coast, uh, are not always uh, very good at working together. And sometimes there's even evidence that that occurs at a state government level, that state government departments don't speak to each other and don't coordinate their plans and their investment strategies to the detriment of, of uh, the outcomes that we all hope to see. So at the moment we're just finishing off a bit of work with uh, uh, Department of Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning, uh, Queens and Government on the integration of what is in fact a plethora of plans and strategies all concerned with various aspects of urban development um, and without preempting what might eventually appear in a published uh, version of that work I can tell you that all the people we spoke with, we spoke with a, a number of people within, mainly within few outside of government, uh, all spoke and were all highly committed uh, to achieving more joined up government and more integrated policy making. Uh, and our, my own view, my personal view is that um, I think there is scope for regional plans such as the SEQ regional plan to serve as a vehicle for greater integration um, and that they have great potential in that regard and that those regional plans, uh, if well constructed and sensibly implemented will provide a, a very effective vehicle for individual cities um, to achieve their aims and ambitions more effectively than trying to do it on their own. But of course there are lots of political and just logistical pitfalls along the way to be avoided. But I will leave it there and uh, uh, thank you for your attention and allow Diane Greg to have their say. I can't remember who's next. I'm next, just keep going. Yep. Greg. All right, thanks Paul. Round of applause. <laughs> so thanks for that, and um, I, I, uh, 10 minutes is way too short for PowerPoint, so I'm just going to talk at you. Um, but the uh, first thing I will say is I'll start from my usual disclaimer that I'm not talking on behalf of the government. This is not government policy. This is just me talking in the role that I have in the project, okay? Good. Got that done. Um, a couple of things I wanted to say. I appreciate uh, Griffith University doing this. Uh, part of what I've been sort of trying to champion is the concept of community conversations around the future of our region so that we just don't have this big discussion once every five years and crickets sort of in between that we actually continue to care and think about how we do the future of our region and our cities. So I think this is part of that bigger picture. So I compliment you guys on, on doing it. Thank you very much. A little bit about me. Um, I, I, I born and bred in Brisbane. I have Q stamped in the back of my head as you had to do that in those days. And um, I also had been around regional planning since it started again in earnest in 1990. I was on the first regional planning advisory group then, back in the middle ages, you know, so I've sort of been doing this for a while. I think that was one of the reasons I was sort of saying is that look, we don't have to reinvent a lot of this stuff. You know, we kind of know a lot of this stuff. There are some key directions that we've been pursuing for a while. Um, I just a quick story about how I got into planning and that, all those grand words that I used in my uh, CV that Tony read out, but I stumbled into it after school because my best mate and I decided to do the same course and the rest all sounded really boring, you know? So, but it turns out that that's what I thought was happening, but at some deeper level, planning and I found each other and we were made for each other and I've really enjoyed everything I've done so far and yet there is a profession that gets to make a difference at a grand scale. So, you know, that's the thing that keeps getting me out of bed in the morning. My mate who did the course with me is actually start, is sort of standing down, not retiring, but semi-retiring shortly, but no chance of that for me, you know. So I've got a regional plan to do apart from anything else. So uh, I just wanted to start with a few things. So in that nearly 40 years of, of, of experience I've had, I don't recall a time of uh, greater change going on, greater fundamental change going on across almost every aspect of our society. 
Uh, urbanisation, of course, is something that is really biting across the world. We're already one, the most, one of the most urbanised nations in the world. The southeast corner is con continuing to increase its proportion of the, the Queensland population and its population of the Australian population, its proportion of the Australian population. So this is a thing that we are dealing with. When we say Queensland is the most decentralised uh, state in, in Australia, I think the truth is to say it's the least centralising. You know? So we, this is a, that's a trend that's going to be with us. Uh, population change is, is massive. You know, demographics are changing like never before. The baby boomers, you know, which I'm one, or I see one or two others, I won't point at you, you know who you are. Um, you know, we're all in that stage of our life um, where we're changing our housing needs, we're changing our, our time of life, we're changing what, what we're looking for out of life. And that has fundamental implications. We are the biggest generation ever um, at that point looking to do that. So in you're thinking about 25 or 50 years time, what does that mean? Well, most of us will be dead in 50, but in the next 25, we'll probably have to do some things. Yourself. Well, <laughs> I said most of us, all right? You know, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, that's not all. The, the actual biggest generation of all is our kids, which is the millennial generation. So that's actually the biggest generation now, and um, which is a pretty good effort on our part. We more than reproduced ourselves, you know? But that group, is the group that is sort of uh, Mitchell Silver, who was out here recently, good friend of Dyes, former president of the American Planning Association, now Commissioner for Parks at New York City, said that, with some truth, I think once, um, that the baby boomers are the generation that stole their kids' future for their present. You know, and I think there's something in that because the baby boomer generation has lived a very resource resource intensive uh, uh, existence and. It's not us that are struggling to find housing. It's not us that want to have different ways of living and being tied to the car to get around. It's not us that are dealing with not being able to find full-time employment. You know, it's, it's the, the Gen Y, the millennial generation. So there's big stuff going on there. Um, economic restructuring because of global economics of 30 years, of 35 years of global economic sort of pressure is actually fundamentally changing the way this economy here is working as it is everywhere in the world. It turns out that our economy in South East Queensland is probably not as focused on export and business to business tradable commodity, I've been economics degree so I'm just talking up that sort of stuff, you know, but we, we're doing stuff that, you know, we're not as good at doing it as some of the other regions of Australia, so there's a big opportunity for us to get into the higher value opportunities that will sustain our prosperity in the future. It turns out that those things, you know, the regional plans traditionally have looked at centres, industrial areas, hello, welcome. Um, industrial areas, uh, what else do we have? We have um, uh, health and knowledge precincts, you know, all of these things, and we treat them like they're separate things that are important. But when you put them all together, you get something else again. You get areas which really have true regional economic significance, and we need to understand that and work out how, what that, how that plays out for our region. Um, technology, well, then, you know, these, when did these things, you know, these, these things are less than seven years old. You know, we all live by them, don't we, you know? Um, Autonomous vehicles, you know, Pokemon, you know, like, I mean, Pokemon's really interesting. It's the first mainstreaming of augmented reality. I think it's a step change situation. If you've read, what's our man, the, um, uh, you know, the, that wrote the book about when, when the peak, when you actually hit the point, the tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell, you know, when you hit the tipping point, things move very quickly. I reckon that's going to happen too. So we won't just be chasing Pokemon in the future. We'll be doing a whole lot of other things with technology. You know, there's lampposts that are going to tell us everything, you know, like the smart city. Those, they're not just going to throw light on, well, they are actually going to throw light on a lot more because they're going to tell us what the, what their temperature is, what the current state of the street is, how much traffic is in that street, how many people in that street, what are the shops nearby that you want to say because it matches your Facebook profile or whatever it is, you know? So there's, we're going to navigate our way around cities differently. Um, resources are under intense pressure. Water, food, food security is a big deal for that, you know? As we head towards nine or 10 billion people in the world, food is a big opportunity, but it's also a big issue. Climate change, of course, is with us. Science apparently doesn't care whether you believe in it or not, you know, so you know, let's, we're just working on the basis that climate change is going to happen and we need to respond to that in a regional planning sense. Um, you know, biodiversity is under challenge. We're one of the most biodiverse regions in the, in the world, but it, we're taking a few hits. So, you know, that's all, this is a few of them, you know. So there's great work being done here by Syro, if you haven't read the Megatrends book by Stefan Glockowitz, or whatever, how, I'm not very good at his second name. 
and PIA, the Planning Institute of Australia, has done some great work recently on megatrends. These things are really important to understand how we think about the future. So that's a really exciting but confusing place to be. The, all the evidence on how bra our brains work show that after you've got about six variables, we really struggle to process them rationally. So, you know, we've we got a, something to do here, you know. But, so that's a, that's a big challenge, isn't it? Um, but, you know, the, wow, the good news is that we're still the same animal, you know. So my proposition to you is that the, the traditional uh, methods of great city building still apply in many respects now, as they have done previously. It might be possible to make a case, and I'd far be it for me to be the person who says it, that the 50 years after World War II are an aberration in how we build cities, and that the more traditional methods of how we've built cities for thousands of years are actually the ones that will sustain us through all of these times of major change. So what does that mean? Well, um, sorry, let's get back to us as an animal. This is what my foundation point. Um, I, just, I, I explained that, is there anyone here from Italian heritage? Italian heritage? Yeah, so look, this is not picking you out, okay? This is just for the purposes of the story, but I explain this by saying we're not Italians. And the reason I say that is that I was in New York, I was in Copenhagen and one day, I was talking to Jan Gell's office who had done all the work in uh, New York to uh, pedestrianise Broadway and all of those massive changes which sparked a complete renaissance about how they move people around and how they understand their public space. Everywhere they went for 18 months, they were sworn to secrecy and everyone told them, we're not Europeans, we're Americans. We won't do that. If we want a coffee, we'll stop and buy a coffee. And if we want to sit down, we'll go to a park. Sidewalks are for people walking. Cars, uh, roads are for, for drivers driving, and that's the end of the story. Don't give us this fancy stuff from Europe, you know? So they did all their surveys, they did all their work, and they found that, in fact, well, people here might respond to it. They did it, and it was an overnight success, and it's changed everything there. That night, I, I spoke to a, a bicycle advocate called Mikhail Culver Anderson. If you follow him on Twitter, as Copenhagen eyes. He's quite aggressive and, and assertive, but he, he made the point about the main street of Copenhagen, which is called the Strogat, which is um, used to be Strogat here. Yeah, sorry, my, 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 my Danish is pretty awful. Can you, can you do that again for me? Strogat. Strogat, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm guessing you're not Italian. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so, so, um, so that, that street was proposed, it was a two-lane traffic sewer in the 60s. Uh, it's a narrow, winding main street of the city. It was proposed to be pedestrianised in the 60s and 70s. Jan Gell actually was one of the people lying down in front of the bulldozers, sort of, no, the other way around, promoting it against those who wanted to, to do it, but not, not to do it. But the point was that the Danish people said, we're not Italians. You know, we don't sit around all day drinking coffee. You know, we, we don't want more space. You know, we got, you know. And so, of course, they did it. It's now one of the most successful pedestrian main street shared use spaces in the world. So by this I say, we're not, I'm not, you know, we're not Italians. Every way it thinks they're special, different, unusual, and that won't work here. The truth is that most of it actually does work if you're sensible about it and you do it within a local context of, of the values of that community. But we're the same animal. We're designed to look down as we walk, not up, because that's where the danger always comes from. We're, de we're designed to recognise people at a certain distance away by our eyesight. If we've got glasses on, it's got 20-20 vision. That's about four or five stories. If we go higher than that, we start to feel uncomfortable. That's what human scale is all about, Rosie, isn't it? Yep. So, you know, we are the same animal. So what does that mean? I just think we've got to sort of, let's do some really fundamental things. Let's look after the systems that sustain us. You know, nature is not a product of mankind. Mankind is a product of nature. Um, I've never said that before. That sounded pretty good. Humankind, sorry. Yeah, yeah okay. that's better. Um, so, um, these things sustain us. Our, our community is sustained by our environment. Our economy is sustained by our community. You know, it's not like we fix the economy and we can sort everything else out. So let's start from there. Um, let's think about good urban structure. So I've said, I tried to have a bit of a go at this. Compact, connected, complete communities. That's, that's four C's. That's pretty good, isn't it? Four C's, compact, complete, connected communities. Um, but we need to do this in a cool and calm and collected way, a deliberative way. So that gets you seven C's. So that's planning sailing the seven C's. Okay, so, um, so a dad joke. I know there's a couple of people pulling faces. I'm sorry, that's just how I am. Um, so, um, but you know, let, let's do, let's deal with good urban structure. Let's deal with places as places. Let's put them together as places. Think of them as places. If they need to be separate, keep them separate. Gold Coast and Brisbane, you know. Um, so um, that's good urban structure, but then good urban design. Um, you know, uh, our places, our buildings, our streets, our, um, our mixtures of use um, 
are all important to the future of how we, we respond to our cities and our uh, future, our region in the future. All these things really need to be uh, considered and so design is certainly a very big piece if you looked at any of the uh, consultation work we've done through um, shaping SEQ with the regional plan project. Um, transport I think is a fundamental piece. I think we've, we've probably spent 25 years proving that the you know, continuing to rely on the car to do the he all the heavy lifting doesn't work and we need to have the opportunity for people to at least have choice about how to do that. Whenever I do this, you have to do this. So I'm not saying going from here where we are now to here, no one's allowed to drive anymore, but I am saying going from here to here a bit, that'd make a difference, wouldn't it, you know? So a step change about how we do our transport, more focus on public transport and active transport. These things have wide benefits, not just trip. Every, I say every trip that shifts from a car to another mode puts that trip onto a more efficient, um, a more um, sustainable and a healthier choice for the person making that change and leaves one more space on the road for everyone else to share if you want to keep driving. So it's not about anyone losing here. Everyone wins if we do that. Um, and uh, food security, agricultural land. Bit of a no-brainer, isn't it? Is there, was it not here the QFF or GROCOM were here today? Anyway, the, you know, if we're really serious about food security, our, our agricultural area is one of our scarce and important community resources for the next 50 years. So, um, but I just think we need to get a bit smarter about how we do things. We need to understand our economy better. We need to understand our housing preferences better. We need to understand how we get around better, what our transport needs are better. And that will be the underpinning of a good regional plan. If we can get transport land use interaction right, that's the, gold, the holy grail of regional planning, says my colleague Warren Rowe, one of um, Di's predecessors at the Gold Coast. So, I, you know, I, I kind of think that um, it's these things, you know, our job as planners is to make complex things simple. That's how I do it from a regional planning sense. Hope that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to stay put here because I was watching poor Damien try and work out how to keep the camera focused on Greg <laughs> as he was roaming. Um, I'm a, a pretty proud local government planner. I've spent my whole life working in uh, working life working in local governments in different regions in Queensland, so North Queensland, Toowoomba, and now the Gold Coast. Uh, I actually think that the regional planning process is fundamental to working out how to put those councils in the same conversation and working out um, how to best use, for example, our very limited infrastructure dollars. If we don't do that and have serious conversations and not to, uh, about how we actually all work together rather than competing with one another, we just end up, I think, um, not necessarily maximising the, the use of our, our money, our people uh, and our energy. And I sort of can't see the point in doing that. Um, as, as you heard earlier, I also spend a lot of my time um, working with planners around Australia previously and now around the world. And they're incredibly envious of the fact that we even get to do this, that we do get to talk at a regional level. And I've been part of the SEQ process for a long time now. I've watched those mayors sit there and actually debate things and come up with solutions that work for everybody. And I think that's a really special thing that we need to, to protect, enhance and um, shout about around the world because I deal with, with planners around Australia and around the world that beg me uh, to come and help them do this in their environments. Um, so for those of you that might not comprehend how special this one is, it, it, it certainly is a, a very unique environment. So we've now seen regional plans rolled out more around Queensland and we're seeing them around the country. Uh, but this one has been around for a while and I think it's pretty special. One of the, um, the aspects of uh, the three of us on the panel this evening is that in my day-to-day -day work on ground, I get to both work within that regional planning context with the state, but then implement how that all comes together on ground. And there are a number of challenges that I see uh, for all of us in those day-to-day -day jobs that are, are the, the sort of microcosm down then of the, the conversations at the regional plan and state and national levels. The Gold Coast is an amazing place to live. I'd spent quite a lot of time holidaying there over the years, but to, to live there as a resident has been a, a real eye-opener. It is just the most amazing place. I'm in four minutes and I'm at the beach where I live, and 20 minutes I'm up in Gondwana rainforest, in, in world standard rainforest. It is just a lovely place. That though means that the 
one of the amazing challenges of my professional life is to help guide how we grow at the pace that we are growing uh, and how we potentially double the population of that city over the next, you know, whatever that period is, is, it will come. How do we do that and protect the quality of that lifestyle? And that for me is, is a sort of microcosm theme of the regional planning exercise. How do you think through all of the challenges that that brings forward to us? Um, how do you ensure housing? How do we diversify our economy? Our region is not just the GC region. We have so many people that do drive up to Brisbane as part of their daily working life. Our region extends down into northern New South Wales with northern New South Wales residents coming up to us and of course our, our, us actually spending time down there. So we've got a slightly more complicated region again, particularly with an interstate boundary. Add into that the linear nature of that city and there's a lot to be done in thinking through how to protect that lifestyle. I think one of the key challenges for us at both at local level and in the regional plan scale is how we work with the community to talk about the benefits of growth as well as the challenges that brings. We all know that people get cranky about roads getting busy. Uh, but some of the good parts about additional people being out and around are these sorts of incredible opportunities that we've got at South Bank. The, the, the benefits that come with density are not something that we talk about a lot. And I, my sense is we need to engage the community better in a conversation around all of that. I, I personally believe that we need to be having conversations, and Greg's mentioned this, in an ongoing basis. But I think we need to be sharing with the community the, the need to consider all of these issues. The need to consider the changing demographics. The changing household structures is fundamental now in the, the, the need for increased housing choice. I'm not for a moment suggesting that everybody needs to live in an apartment. I believe in housing choice. But what I'd really like is our communities to be educated and to understand the impacts of some of those decisions. Uh, Greg and I are long-term advocates of... That, that switches off. I thought he was about to disagree with me. Um, we have long-term advocates of the concept of housing, afford uh, sorry, um, affordable living, as opposed to it just being about the price of your house. Because if you are buying a cheap house, but you're driving extensive, uh, extensively to your job and to all of your other social networks, that comes at a cost. So I'm, uh, one of the, th the things that I'm certainly working through is how I work more with the community to talk about all of those challenges and all of the benefits. How do we, as the GC, diversify our economy, make sure that there are jobs for all of the people that are, are moving to live in this lovely place? How do we protect the incredible green space uh, that life on the Gold Coast is? There are parks everywhere I turn and it's wonderful. Um, the birds, uh, every morning a, a bird calls in my area are completely different to what I've ever experienced before. How do we keep all of that? How do we enhance the lovely quality of that lifestyle as the place continues to grow? How do we alter our transport systems? Greg spoke a second ago about the step change opportunities of, of Pokemon. My team and I have been playing with the concept of how we could actually use an augmented reality like that in terms of engaging with the public around planning. It's a better way to get their heads around what might this mean if we're thinking about a revitalisation of a local community and to get them out and around engaging in that. A step change opportunity as we see it uh, is the potential of the Commonwealth Games Wonderful opportunity for the city, wonderful opportunity for the state. Uh, but part of that exercise will be about the opportunity for step change in public transport engagement. Getting the community into really stepping into that space. We've seen success in that in other cities. Vancouver in particular um, was, was highly successful in achieving that step change in public transport usage afterwards. Hamish spoke earlier uh, about the concept of happiness and how important that is. That for me is something that people often disregard as one of the fluffy things that planners like to talk about. I don't actually think it is that. I think it's fundamental in the political environment in which I live. If we don't engage our communities in understanding um, the importance of all of these matters and acceptance of um, participation in, I'm hoping, some of those key decisions, they won't be happy with what's going on, which then leads to continual political pressure. Now, how you do that, and how you do that in the big questions that are facing us, and in the big decisions, for example, about infrastructure investment, is not an easy challenge, 
but that's this profession is not about easy challenges it's about making a difference in the world and I think there that's a, a key challenge for us in the coming months and years uh, more generally so I'm just running through my notes to check. I think that was everything I wanted to raise from an initial perspective. Um, I was very keen to spend more time with you in a Q&A session. So I think I'll stop on that point. Excellent. Well, I'd just like to thank our panellists for three quite varied and very provocative initial statements. And at this stage, I'm going to hand the operation over and um, so there's a roaming, I think you've got a roaming mic or have you? No, you haven't. Terrific. So, um, questions from the floor, please. Um, so the run order of tonight, um, we're happy to take questions uh, from the floor. I think we have at least half an hour. I think we run till seven, but uh, we can run a few minutes over if there's a, a ongoing enthusiasm for, uh, for asking questions to our panel. So um, I'm happy to come down to you and hand the microphone to you just so that everybody is clear on the question that you ask. Uh, and you're welcome to ask a question of an individual panel member or indeed uh, ask a question to the entire panel. So do we have, we have an opening question. I'll be right down. Thank you, Peter Dennis, um, CEO of SEQ Water. One of the um, big challenges we face in South East Queensland is uh, our catchments and the broader regional planning, livable city. Um, and these catchments are our food bowl as well. So a lot of the, we have some of the most open catchments uh, in the country, a uh, lot of uh, food production there, a lot of recreation. Um, we don't have to look too far back to the 26th of January 2013 when the turbidity or colloidal matter coming down our river system nearly um, ceased, uh, well, ceased our ability to take water out and feed into the, uh, to, the, to our city. So the, the question's twofold. How, how big is our city? How do we define our city? And how do we get... Um, the ratepayer base that's sort of based in sort of the built up areas to, I suppose, appreciate the cities much bigger and, and to actually fund what needs to be done in terms of improving our catchments um, and also working with farmers to, to sort of uh, protect the loss of soil and all that, which is, which is an integrated problem. How, how, do, how do we we solve that problem from a regional planning perspective? And I think it touched on all three of um, the, 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 the opening talks. I'm happy to kick off. I, I'm I'm have, yep, you go for it. But I was smiling when you said that because when I first moved down uh, to SEQ from northern Queensland, I was working in uh, one of the rural communities. I, I was working in Gatton Shire at the time. Um, and the regional planning conversations that were happening then were about the fact that we need to get that message out that those rural areas are the lungs, uh, that the phrasing at the time was that they were the lungs of the, the broader Brisbane city. Um, trying to get people to understand the importance of that space to allow the strongly connected and more dense nature of the inner cities itself to function a space for people to go out and recreate, but also obviously fundamentally a space for incredible food production. Um, that's that is such a fertile valley. I think one of the challenges around doing that, particularly as the farming industry is, is tough at times, um, is working out how we can supplement those incomes uh, without losing what is a very special place to live. So how do you allow the supplementary incomes on a farm without it then transforming over? Um, I've spoken with many farmers over the years who, who agree and, and want desperately to protect the quality of that agricultural land. But how do we, we actually do that from a financial perspective when for some people it's actually, they believe far better as an individual to give that land over to housing. Um, so that, that's one of our, our bigger challenges. Yeah, I'll have a crack at it too, Peter. Um, yep, so, um, <coughs> Look, I think one of the fundamental controls that regional planning in South East Queensland use are regional land use categories. So the urban footprint is used effectively to define the extent of our cities, which is a really important thing that we didn't have until 12 years ago. We have effectively an urban growth boundary. Now, 
Urban growth boundaries are not set in stone and locked away forever. Every, everywhere they're used, they're a management tool to think deliberately and carefully about any extensions of your city that you're going to promote. So, it, you know, that's, that, that's an important thing. The converse of that, though, is the regional landscape and rural production area, which I always find to be a bit of a mouthful. But, but anyway, that, you know, the green, the green bed. And I think one of the things that we have to actually kind of deal with in dealing in this, this next version of the regional plan is, is advancing the understanding that as we become more intense in our terms of the way we're using land inside the urban footprint, that the land outside the urban footprint becomes even more important. And so there's this sort of yin and yang is kind of how I, I don't think we can write that in the plan, but you know, that's kind of what, how I think of it is that the two things are completely mutually interdependent and you can't have one without the other. And if we could even get that up, that would be a great way to start, wouldn't it? You know, in terms of finding you some funding for you, I've got no answers. But uh, <laughs> but the look that the you know the regional plan can only do so much too. I mean, a lot of people look to the regional plan to sort of solve everything, and and we're focused on things where we need to make a regional expression of policy, which is important for the region and is not being done by some other instrument of government or whatever. So, you know, I think we will certainly see that those fundamental controls will continue. Um, there'll be, I hope, some discussion about that whole yin and yang thing about the interdependence. It's not just water quality, it's about access. You know, all of the research shows us that access to nature is really important for our mental well-being. Um, recreation opportunities that aren't sort of intense and city-based need to be in those locations. So there's a whole lot of things, apart from stewarding our main sort of um, natural assets and a whole lot of things that are going on out there. We need to kind of get that understanding so that those areas are actually just as important to the city as the city is to them. Um, a couple of things come to my mind. One, one is what I think is a kind of perennial challenge for administrators, if you like, politicians perhaps, and, and that's defining the boundaries of the areas that we then use to contain and to perform our planning functions within. And, and in my view, there's a, there's a tension between, if you like, the kind of functional aspects of that definition. So for example, I don't know if it gets discussed much here, it certainly used to get discussed in the UK 20 or so years ago, a functional urban region, urban or economic region. So, so you know, defining areas on the basis of their economic functions and the degree of integration uh, within that area compared to a, another area. I mean, a bit like travel to work areas. Now, it could be that you use catchments. You know, catchments is another functional kind of rational basis on which to draw lines on maps and say that you know this is our jurisdiction. So, you've got those kind of technical, rational arguments. On the other hand, I think there's a more kind of emotional, political dimension to it, which is that I think you want people to identify. It helps if you can, if people can identify in some way with whatever that entity is, that they feel some form of kind of emotional attachment to it. Because if they don't, then you've got a political challenge getting people out to vote, paying any attention, you know, you can engage in, in planning exercises and people just won't come out and engage with you because they go, this is talking about some administrative re region that, you know, is, is represented by, you know, straight lines and right angles on a map, you know, what the hell is that about? That's just kind of, who, who came up with that? So, so it, it, it's difficult sometimes reconciling the two, but that's what we have to um, try and achieve at a variety of spatial scales. Um, second, second observation is, I mean, water security is absolutely vital. It always has been. I mean, if you take a very long historical perspective, we know that you know um, the life and death of cities and the and the birth and the growth and the perhaps death of cities is often inextricably linked to w their water security. If they if they can't maintain uh, the security of their water supplies, then then they're stuffed basically. Um, and, and we're, it's almost that we kind of forgot that, but now we're realizing again that that's a vital thing. I've just come from a conference in Singapore where, as you can imagine, um, their water security is, is quite at uh, the forefront of their minds, because <laughs> uh, most of it comes across the border from Malaysia, um, although they're becoming a lot more uh, self-sufficient. Um, the final thing is just, I, again, and this is maybe a kind of pommy perspective on things, is, is um, you know, we're, it, it, 
in planning terms, if we're renowned for anything, it was you know new towns maybe, but green belts. The, you know the the the, imp the definition and the imposition of a green belt around urban areas to contain sprawl and to stop the entire country, you know, which could fit into the southeast corner here quite easily, um, just becoming one suburban, undifferentiated suburban mass. Now there are plenty of critiques of the effectiveness of green belts, and lots of people think that they're kind of, you know, the, the <coughs> end of civilization as we know it. But I, I think they serve a useful function in the UK. They're 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 being undermined. But also, it's if, if here we have an urban growth boundary or an urban footprint, then it kind of begs the question of what's beyond that and, and kind of why put, if you're going to have an urban growth boundary, why put it here rather than there? Now, if the answer is because if we push it a bit further out, we will be losing high quality agricultural land or we'll be losing, you know, um, world renowned rainforest, then that's a pretty compelling argument. And it's as much, so it's not just about containing urban growth, but it's protecting what's in that area that will otherwise just get nibbled away. And, and I, I live on Tambury Mountain. When I drive in from Tambury every morning into the Gold Coast to work, I, I see that, you know, I've been there nine years, and, and, I, and I see the steady encroachment. And occasionally I say to Di, what the hell were you doing allowing that thing? And she says, well, that was Warren <laughs> Rose's fault. <you> know. <laughs> uh, uh, or in, 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 or we can go way back to Greg Van when he was at Bow Desert uh, Shire Council. Um, but, you know, I think that is a serious problem that, that you know, if we're not vigilant, we, we will see the kind of slow and incremental, it's the kind of frog boiling syndrome. You won't kind of notice it yeah. until you go away for a long time. You come back and you go, oh my God, what that? <laughs> How did we lose that? Death you know? of a thousand cuts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do we have any further questions on the floor? Okay. Um, just before we move to the next question, I might remind anyone that's tweeting tonight's event that our hashtag is uh, hashtag GU Impact. Uh, thank you very much. I'm John Minnery. Um, I, I'm kind of two questions that are tied together. Uh, a, a lot of the planning in the past regional plans had this kind of breathless haste about them because the population of southeast Queensland was always the fastest growing. The um, what, uh, you know, th 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 there were millions of people crossing the border every day, and we had to provide houses and jobs. And, and that's not the case anymore, as I understand it. I mean, the rate of population growth has kind of slowed a bit, um, as I understand it. Um, and, and there were a lot of things that were done in that period of kind of haste, which I think people now regret. Um, you know, like I'm, I mean, just two things. One, well, the Gold Coast and, and the... Not the whole lot. No, no, not the, well... It's a really nice place. Yeah. It's a really nice place. <laughs> except for some of the old canal estates, except for the high rise right on the four dunes, um, except for housing in flood prone areas, which is, you know, the same kind of thing that happens in a lot of other places where there are these mistakes. So it's a kind of two pronged question. G given that the population increase isn't as great as it used to be, how's the planning changing? And given that we did do a lot of things which we might regret now, how, how, how can planners fix up past mistakes, basically? I'll have a, I'll have a crack at it first. The, the, um, the first thing is, yes, population growth has slowed, um, but the, how that plays out is the projections for 2041 are now 200,000 less than they were, which means it's only 2 million people we're planning for over that period, not 2.2. So. They're still big numbers. And ultimately, the time frames don't really matter. Like, it's really, you know, you're actually looking at a, we've got to think of ourselves as a place with a bigger population. What are we going to do about it? And whether that's hit in 2038, 2041, 2048, probably doesn't matter that much. It's still that we're going to get to that point. Interestingly, I think a lot of the shift has been we get a lot more direct in migration from overseas now than we, than we used to. So. Um, so that's the, f the answer is that the context has certainly changed, it has slowed, but it's not like it's therefore a doddle. You know, there's still a lot of, you know, we're 3.4 million now, we think we'll be 5.4-ish in 25 years. So that's still very significant change. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that a lot of the mistakes that you point to aren't a result of the, 20, the last 12 years of statutory planning, you know, but so there are a lot of things that were locked in a long time ago and most of the stuff in the Gold Coast. By the way, I don't think the high rise 
spine along the, along the, the, the front is a, is a mistake. I think it's one of the most distinctive and amazing urban forms everywhere. Everyone doesn't want to be the Gold Coast except they like going there. I don't know. <laughs> but um, so, you know, th um, so, th you know, I think, I think there are a lot of, but, but I think we can get better at it, John. There's no doubt that some of the decisions that have been made in the statutory regional plan thing with a bit more time and thought and carefulness might have been done differently. So we should learn from that. So, you know, that's, that's my answer. Hmm. I mean, I'd, uh, my view would, I think it's possibly the same as Greg's, that um, in planning for growth, you have to be cognizant of the kind of the pace and the temporal dimension. But notwithstanding that, I think it's still sensible to have a view of if and when this growth occurs, where would we most prefer it to be? to the extent that we can affect that, and I think that's a separate and, and really big question, um, but, and, and that goes back to my kind of scepticism about UK regional policy, you know, you spent 60 odd years trying to encourage people not to go to the southeast corner of England and go to the north and the west, and they don't want to, <laughs> you know, or they'll go there a bit, and then they drift back, you know, it's still, you know, you could argue that without any of those kind of policy interventions, the southeast would be even more crowded, more congested, and more kind of, um, it, you know, unlivable. But still, people choose to live there. I mean, it's, you know, it's a bit like the Sydney phenomenon. You know, average new house price of a million dollars, but people are still going there. I don't, you know, I, I can't understand why, why they don't come up here and live on the Gold Coast, and, but, um, and maybe they, they will in the future. So, so I think it's about thinking, well, if, if if it happens, then where do we want to put them? Now, it may be that you know it's not in five years, it's in 10 years, or it's in 30 years, but we still should have a, a view of where and in what form. And I tend to think also that, um, I mean, I find it intriguing that, that, that when, whenever anyone, especially somebody from overseas, criticizes Australian suburbia, it, it provokes a very interesting response. You know, who are you coming over here latte swilling metrosexual telling me that I shouldn't aspire to live in a detached house in the suburbs. And, and what I find intriguing is that when I look at the detached houses in the new suburbs that I drive past every day, I don't believe they're delivering the kind of Australian suburban dream that is in, still in most people's mind, which is a dream that was formed in the 60s and the 70s. So now, you know, you're not getting a backyard that's big enough for your kids to live in. You haven't got a street that they can go and play cricket in. You don't know your neighbours. You're miles from anywhere. You know, it's like, what, which aspect of the dream is, are those developments? Good job, Guy Gibson's not here, and I might mention Yarra <laughs> Bilba, but you know, what exactly are you getting if you go and live in a kind of, Ex pine forest in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> he 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 tell he, he'll come out with a long thing, but you know. So so I think that there's a there's there's a capacity to we have a capacity as planners and architects and urban designers, a whole array of professions, to imagine a built environment that actually <laughs> delivers some of the things that we did like about suburbia: neighbourliness, safety, high quality uh, design you know, a pleasant environment where you can walk around, bump into people, s see enough people to say hello that you get, kind of get distracted. But, you know, we don't, that doesn't, that's not restricted to detached houses way out on the fringes. It's sometimes difficult to achieve, you know, in the, in the, in the lift shafts or the, or the lifts and the kind of corridors of a high rise, but it can be achieved in, in higher density inner suburban areas, not just on the, it's not being delivered on the fringes now in the new suburban estates. So, can I just I'm comment on a couple of those things, Tony? Yeah. It's, it's, it, no, it's all, it's all very interesting. And I, so um, the, a, a couple of things is like 75% of our housing stock in South East Queensland right now is still detached housing. So we are overwhelmingly still detached yeah. housing, yeah. you know. So, um, but where we have come from is that when regional planning started in the 90s, I don't know the exact figures, but I would guess that that was 70 or 80% of the building stock was, was houses on land. By the time we got to the 2004 regional plan, it set a target of 60% greenfill, 40% infill, which it achieved. The 2009 one went for 50-50. The current projections are showing us without touching another lever, it'll be 54% infill, 
46% greenfield. So mm. there is a change going on. I think regional plan has been part of that change. Um, so, you know, they, these are big things that I reckon we've got to, we've got to deal with, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you died, didn't you? No, I was just, in, in terms of that, you know, the, the Gold Coast new planning scheme, which uh, commenced in February this year, has a 70-30 split. Um, not two thirds, one third, so we'll say 70-30 for the moment. And that is about recognising the, the alternate choices that people are seeking to make and that are actually being delivered on ground. I've been looking at the figures around what has been being constructed and where people are mm. choosing to live. Mm. And I think as society is changing so much and our needs on a daily basis are changing, people's desires about where they want to live and what those benefits of living close to an outside space, whether it's the mm. beach or whether it's something mm. like the river, they're the things that we have to factor mm. in compared to all of the traditional thoughts. Mm. I think the dream is, is now altering, mm. uh, which is not to say that some people won't want to still live in yeah. a 600 square metre backyard place, and yeah. that's perfectly okay. But I think the, the benefit of these conversations is that we're understanding what that means. I'm a really strong believer in an urban footprint from that perspective of understanding the entire infrastructure costs to the city and the state. I'm a rather long-term advocate, but I'd really like the same level of infrastructure planning um, that, that local governments need to do for everything at a state level. Because it's those costs of where are the next schools, are we buying the land ahead of time, are we ready for them, as well as the big ticket costs around transport infrastructure. Um, and the rest of, of, of human interest, infrastructure, both soft and hard, that I think we need to have more logical sequenced planning. Mm. I'm with Greg in that I'm not worried about whether the, the doubling of the Gold Coast happens in year dot or dot plus two. We need to be thinking about those bigger picture perspectives now and then being able to adapt in the short term. Mm. Oh, I just want to say one more thing. I think there's a big <laughs> difference between sprawl and suburbia. Suburbia mm. kind of cops a bum rap being written off as sprawl, you know, mm. like, so Brent Totteran, who was out here as part of our Thought Leaders, Leaders series in the first round of the conversations, makes the distinction, that dis the distinction between suburbia and sprawl is primarily about car, car dependence. Mm. If you're only providing people in that lifestyle one option of how they get to everything, mm. then you've got sprawl. If you're actually providing them other options because they are somewhere, they have the capacity to get public transport to work, or they can <coughs> actually walk to school or to the shop or to, you know, that, or they can ride a bike and you're actually pro providing genuine options of travel as to how they get around and facilities that they can get to by those options. That's a, that's, that it can still be suburbia, but it, it's a completely different model. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think one of the things I find intriguing about somewhere like Yarra Bilba and it feeds into debates about, you know, what people want and, you know, what their preferences and choices are. So, you know, the, the, the current phase of Yarra Bilba was sold out, you know, it, mm. there's no problem selling, you know, mm. they're selling, I think the last time Guy told me, 60 plus percent uh, at the moment are going to investors, so they're not going to own rock buyers. Wow. Right? And they're going to investors from interstate. So there's people from Sydney, not big institutional investors, buying off the plan and then renting them. And again, they can rent them out, so there's, you know, there's, there isn't an occupancy problem. My view would be that the people who are then ending up renting at Yarra Bilba, uh, I don't know, I mean, I'm trying to persuade them to pay me to do some research <laughs> on this by asking the people who are living there what they thought they were buying into and whether they were getting it, but he was a bit reluctant to do that. Um, I can understand that. Um, but I'd be interested to know, you know, whether those people are, uh, are kind of going, well, I'll go there because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's reasonably close to Brisbane and it's the most, afford it may not be affordable, but it's the most affordable three bedroom housing I can, I can find, you know, and it's new and, and everything else. But it, it, you know, that's not, it's not owner occupiers buying it. So it's, it's, it's other people renting it and I suspect it's because they, they don't have a huge amount of choice. You know, if you want to live in a detached house, then, you know, you've got to go out there and, and you might say, well, I've got to, you know, I pay the same rent for a one bedroom apartment somewhere closer in or the same rent for a three bedroom apartment. And if the price is that I've, you know, I'm five miles from Logan, five k's from Logan Village, then so be it. 
it, there's, uh, we probably don't need any more questions. We can just keep talking. But yeah, I mean, it, that, that's right. And the, the, the choices that people make. So increasingly, like, people, you can't categorise generations yeah. completely, yeah. but people in the millennial uh, Gen Y are more, have a higher propensity to choose <laughs> s choose place over space. Yeah. So they will go for the smaller, you know, thing nearer well, the action yeah. than the bigger one that's further away from everything. Whereas the baby boomers are tradition more disposed to living, want, they want space first, and then they're they're happy to drive until they get old and they decide that they want to go and colonise the inner city again. You know, so so um, there's there's sort of a lot going on, but it is that affordable living question. So a lot of people do choose to go and live because that's all they can afford to buy for the cost of the house. But when you do the maths properly, you know, they're, yeah. they're choosing a very expensive yeah. lifestyle, yeah. which is actually having a whole lot of other implications yeah. for how well their family functions and a whole lot of things, you know. So there's, there's, it's a bit simpler than just the cost of the house, which yeah. is the power of the concept of affordable living, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think there were other questions that we were yeah, yeah. Sorry, yes. uh, Well, we've had two, two great questions so far and plenty of fascinating answers. So can we have a third question from the floor? Are there a hand up? No, thanks. Um, I'm not going to ask a design-oriented question, but design oh, is... come on. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm just um, thinking about this uh, livability um, concept and the benefits of, of density. Um, are we actually going to get to the point with population growth here where we can reach critical mass to enable um, people-centred mobility? Um, you know, so delivering the kinds of benefits that, you know, I live within 5Ks of the CBD here and I have incredible choice when it comes to um, transport and mobility and I, I can mix it up. So that step change that we kind of look to um, big events like the Commonwealth Games, switching people's mindset there's that, but are we actually going to have the critical mass of population to support a decent kind of trans transport system? Do you want to go? I, look, I think we're certainly on the way to that, and, and for me that's part of the logic around an urban footprint. Um, the step change opportunities, though, are not all you know, Games is obviously an amazing opportunity, but that's not the sort of thing that comes along every day. The other huge one for us, apart from a very clear mandate from Council um, in my case, uh, about going up, not out, which is the Mayor's uh, consistent message when he's out talking with the community. But the, the other fundamental step change opportunity that we're seeing is the benefits of the light rail. Uh, for a project that was very long in its inception and was fought long and hard for by the Council and, and budgeted by the community and the Council for many years before it became a reality, it is such a stunning success. Yeah. And we're now starting to see that. We're seeing, I know when I was looking to buy, that was one of the first things real estate agents were telling me about, how many metres I want to a light rail stop. Um, we're starting to see and understand um, that people are, are just loving it. I mean, it's record transit levels, um, it's such a strong campaign and from the community as well for the light rail three extensions. Uh, so I think we've all got to be looking at if we're going to spend the sort of money that we're spending on key infrastructure, which isn't just transport, it, it can be the, the, the art galleries and all of the wonderful facilities that are here, as an example. It's about making sure that we're getting the best return for that for the community and thinking that through, uh, which is, is one of the reasons that I'm such an advocate of that integration of infrastructure planning and thought process with our land use plans. Um. So thanks, Rosie. I'd just like to recognise for those who don't know you, that's Rosie Kennedy, who has been from the sub Centre of Subtropical Design, who's done some landmark research, <laughs> which we're finding very useful, as you know, Rosie. So that, that, thanks for that. Um, the, uh, the, the thing I would say is that oh, I've never been to a community or a city that doesn't bag out its tra public transport. <laughs> Everyone thinks theirs is awful. Yeah. New York thinks theirs yeah. is awful. You know, like <laughs> Vancouver which is held up as a world leading model of transport yeah. land use integration. Yeah. They all think their, their, <laughs> their system is awful, you know? So, and, and you know, I, I take from that, we actually had the bones of a very good public transport system here. We have an extensive heavy rail network, which yeah. cities in the world would die for, you know? Like, 
okay, we can use it better, but it's there already, you know. So, so, so what, I, what I'm trying to get, I know you're, that's not what you're saying. What, I, what I'm saying is that, so we have the basis. So if you look at the state infrastructure plan, the idea is to sweat your assets harder as your first option. And I think there's a big opportunity to sweat our assets harder. Um, Cross River Isle is obviously important to unlock capacity across the whole rail system. But um, if that piece of the puzzle is in place, for relatively small amounts of capital investment, you can unlock an enormous amount of PT capacity. Um, buses will always do the heavy lifting everywhere. That that's what the, everywhere does. They're the sort of they're the hero of the transport system, like the unsung hero, because everyone sort of I don't know thinks that you know, it's only a bus, you know. But um, so you know, so there's a lot we can do before. But but our our issue is that our urban form does mean there are big parts of our region which don't have that, that the access to that. And that's our challenge, you know, being able to fund that. I mean, I think there's a there's another challenge, which is, um, I mean, it's a, it's a big enough challenge to 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 get the kind of critical mass or the density to bring infrastructure to sprawl or suburban landscapes. I mean, there's there's another one, which is upgrading the capacity in increasingly densified inner urban areas and I don't know much about it but occasionally you'll hear engineers saying well you know this this stormwater system is or this drainage system or this water treatment plant is at capacity you know we can't it's okay you die allowing this that and the other to but you know the system can't cope with it so without a major or or we're you know we're one new tower block off hitting hitting capacity and, and, and who's going to sort that out and I mean, we have that also with the with those other connective infrastructures. You know, the, the stories of I don't know what it's like in Brisbane, but on the Gold Coast, you know, you, you can't get Telstra to give you a connection until you know somebody falls off their perch and frees up a you know a line on the switchboard kind of yeah. thing. Um, so there's there are some serious problems I think with with increasing the population uh, uh, servicing through infrastructure. The needs of a of an increasingly dense urban population. Well, two more things I want to say. Uh, another overseas colleague says the best transport plan is a good land use plan, and I think there's a lot of mm. lot of truth in that. You know, the be the more closely we integrate those two, the better we do everything. And that doesn't mean you have to build a whole lot more transport. The logic is to get a lot more people living where you can take advantage of that. Mm. But infill ain't infill. You know, like it is uneven. And yeah. so there are places where there isn't capacity in the assets and you actually have to understand that yeah, yeah. before you go targeting that place for, for more people. Yeah. I mean, I think there's another thing I'd say about accessibility and almost, you know, what, what's it reasonable to expect to be able to access on foot or on a bike? Now, it seems to me that it, it's not unreasonable to say I should be able to go out and get a pint of milk or a loaf of bread or a newspaper, all of which shows my age. Or a Pokemon. Yes. And it maybe it's reasonable that you know, if my kids were of an age, they could walk to school. I think that would be a good thing. So, but you know, should I be able to expect to walk to a football stadium or an opera house? Or so. So there are certain things that we need to kind of imagine and plan on a regional scale that, that says, well, no, you can't all have an, op you know, opera's good or, you know, sport footy's good, but you can't all have one in your backyard. So we've got, you know, we've got to be selective. And, and then we've got to make those tough decisions about where it's going to go. I mean, I, I, you get it a bit with, somebody mentioned, you know, knowledge precincts and things like that. I'm, I'm slightly skeptical about the capacity of everywhere to have a, a knowledge precinct, unless by knowledge precinct, you know, you mean a little room over there that's got a computer in it, you know. And you go, well, that's our knowledge precinct, you know, and you go, oh, okay, but no, it's not, you know. Um, you know, how many knowledge precincts could you sensibly have in South East Queensland? I don't know the answer to that, but I don't think you can have them on every street corner. So you, you've got to decide if there's only going to be a few, if they've got to be of a scale that requires significant investment, then you've got to be selective and you're back then to that political challenge of, you know, how do you persuade, I was going to say Pam Parker, but, um, you know, how would you have persuaded Pam Parker Luke to, to not, Luke Smith not to have an, you know, not to aspire to have a, a knowledge precinct in Logan Central because it's not viable. 
I wouldn't have liked to have tried that. I wouldn't like to try it with Luca. I certainly wouldn't have liked to try it with Pat. Yeah. Time for drinks. Yeah. We'll take one more question. Um, but just to remind you, there are drinks and canopies uh, afterwards, so you'll have an opportunity to talk to the speakers as well then. Um, so we'll take one more. We had one at the back and one at the front. The one at the back went up first. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll have to let your one. <laughs> I'm sure the speakers will be more than happy to speak to you afterwards. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, I'm Mike Foster from SCQ Water. You guys started the conversation tonight um, touching on community engagement and the importance of that. Um, we're on a journey ourselves. Um, we're responsible for doing the next 30-year water plan for South East Queensland. The good news, everyone in the room, um, because of the wonderful investment we made during the drought and because all you wonderful folk don't use as much water as you used to before the drought, we don't need another source, big bulk source in South East Queensland until um, beyond 2030 and probably perhaps many years beyond that. So we've got a lot of time on our hands and we've just started this process of engaging the community. So my, my question to the panel is, and this is something we're grappling with as a business, how far do you take engagement? Do you take engagement all the way where the community actually shapes and, ult and ultimately helps make the decision at the end of the day? Water infrastructure, big, big investment. Um, yeah, just curious from the panel's perspective, from a planning perspective, how far do you take community engagement? I just, I just can't remember the person's name. I was looking at Dial Paul. You know, the, 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 the spectrum of engagement. Armstein, oh. Sherry Armstein. That's it. Yeah. The ladder. So, the ladder. So, so engagement goes from you know, like we're just going to tell you what we're doing, through to you making the decision. You know, so I think the important thing is to actually understand what your aim is at the beginning, and you're clear about that. Because if you go out saying we're just telling you what we're doing and people think they're making the decision, that is a recipe for disaster. So you've got to be really clear about what, how you're trying to engage. Um, the, other, the other point I would make is that there is a really significant uh, you know, generational issue with any engagement that you do. Um, people under 30 generally aren't connected to the traditional sort of ways of doing engagement and they're often disconnected with these processes more generally, yet it's not they don't care, they just don't, they don't find the ways we have traditionally done it are the best way to engage. And um, so, but when you think about it, we're a regional plan, we're talking about 25 to 50 year time frame, well they're the people whose mm -hmm. future we're really planning for, mm -hmm. you know, be good to, so that's why social media is important of course, but that's only one additional way to do it. So. So the, the, answer, the answer is like be clear about what your organisation is trying to do. If you genuinely are asking people for input on an open basis and we haven't made any decisions yet, be clear about that. If it's actually that, no, we're, we're, we're heading towards thinking about different options, we'd like you to help inform us about which options we should look at and which ones we ultimately choose, you know, that's a different way. So positioning it, I think, is the most important thing. And I would say there's horses for courses. There are times that you, you want to be on all the different stages of that matter. But it's the crucial bit is about knowing where and, and which one's right. I think the biggest issue for us is how to engage with the future people, um, the different generations, because it's just, it's so difficult. They're, they're often very busy. We don't, you know, these sorts of meetings are no longer as, as effective as they perhaps used to be if they ever mm -hmm. really were. It's just that now it's really clear mm -hmm. to us. So we're certainly rethinking everything we do. I mean, as a council, we use a, a Have Your Say panel where members of the community can register mm -hmm. and they, they send out burst questions on whatever the key topics are. It's been a fascinating way to understand what a very broad range of the community think about things. How many people have you got on the total? Oh, it's, it's tens, that, of, thousands, tens of thousands. Tens of thousands, yeah, yeah. So a very immediate way of yeah. actually gauging the temperature on things. Um, uh, I, I've... I've got what might be a bit of a heretical view. Um, I, <laughs> I, I don't have too much of a problem with representative democracy. Oh yeah, oh, great. Um, and I think, I, I don't agree that so-called direct democracy is necessarily and inherently better than representative forms. Of de representative democracy was developed because of the problems that were inherent in direct forms of democracy, including the tyranny of the majority. Um, so a, a well-functioning representative democracy, I think, uh, serves us quite well. 
especially given that most of us are perfectly happy to allow our elected representatives to do all that nasty, horrible work on our behalf, and, and we don't actually want to spend all our spare time being active, engaged citizens. We're, we're perhaps willing to do it on occasions, we're perhaps willing to do it more than we're currently asked, but most of us um, don't want to go out every evening and engage in debate about everything, even the future of water infrastructure in southeast Queensland. So um, I'm a bit sceptical, and again, perhaps this is because I was in the UK when the Brexit vote happened, <laughs> I'm slightly sceptical yeah. about giving too much power to the people. Because they sometimes <laughs> make rather engagement by yes no vote. Engagement by yes yes no vote. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult yeah. to avoid. Once you start yeah. getting, you, yeah. you know, you end up having yeah. kind of plebiscites on kind of stupid questions. Sorry, all the time. Michael. The only other thing I'd say is that it's useful to actually do statistically valid sampling oh, across the population, absolutely. so you actually get a true read on whether, rather than just who you hear from. So it's good to do both. Hey, Michelle, good. Like to I, 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 indeed. <laughs> That's, I think, a good point to end on. So I'd just like to thank everybody for their contributions. The, the panel, um, Paul, Greg and Di, and um, Tony for standing in as um, the roaming mic man. So thank you, everybody, and thank you all for turning up. Now, just a couple of very minor things. Um, on your seats, there is a feedback form. If you could fill that in and drop it off. There's a box outside. And also, the big attraction of outside is, I believe, there is some food and some drinks. And uh, please continue um, the discussions and bail any of us up out there. So thank you all.